So anyway, tonight, uh, Eide called me. She said, you know, we've got to get back to basics again. And I says, Eide, I've been thinking about this for a long time. I says, we have a lot of new members. We have a lot of people here that didn't start with us. When we started this organization, we focused exclusively on Washington Butterflies. That's all we did. We went through every group, and uh, John Pelham was a big uh, help in that, uh, introducing us to all the species, and we learned how to identify them. So when we went out in the field, we could see them and know what they were. But we've kind of drifted a little bit. Not that it's bad, but as we've drifted into a lot of other topics that are not directly related to our Washington State Butterflies, and as a result of that, you know, I thought, what about our new members that are to come in here? We hardly ever talk. I mean, Dave is real good about giving, you know, the uh, Butterfly of the Month, but uh, there's very little we know about them. And I thought, you know, some of the new people particularly would like this. And I know some of your old timers are going to say, oh, boy, you know, I know all this stuff. <coughs> That's fine. I just, I hope it's a review that is useful to you, and maybe there's something in it that you can learn as well. But, I know a lot of the new members, I, I hope this will be real helpful to you and uh, that you will be able to benefit from this on all the field trips that uh, are going to take place this year. So anyway, we're going to start out with hair streaks and uh, a few facts about hair streaks before I get started that you can take a look at here. The, the family is like King and Day and uh, there's a <laughs> real controversy. This includes the blues also, so the blues and hair streaks in it. And in our state at least, uh, the metal parks. But uh, when you get out of the state, uh, that seems to kind of fall apart. Down in the, I've been doing a lot of work with neotropical butterflies now, and the people in South America and Central America, they do not accept the fact that the uh, metal marks are in Lycanidae. They still keep them in their own family. So we're not going to argue those issues at all, but they, they, and we only have one metal mark in our state anyway, so it's not a big deal. Anyway, this is the Lycanids. They're really pretty small butterflies. I got them in uh, metric and also English. They're, they're, they, they range anywhere from a little less than an inch, and you're going to say, man, man, they're tiny little things, aren't they? That's the wingspan out, inch, uh, to over an inch. Uh, we have one hair streak that actually is almost an inch and a quarter. It's, uh, it's a pretty good size. In fact, it looks like a, a name valid. It didn't even look like a, a hair streak. Uh, we have 19 species within the state. Of those 19, two of them, really are basically Western Washington butterflies. And you say, well, that's not a very good percentage. Well, that's kind of typical for Western Washington. We are not well known for butterflies here. Most of the butterflies are Eastern Washington. That's why if you look at our trips, most of them are east of the Cascades. And there's a good reason for that, because that's where most of the butterflies are. But we have two species that are really basically west of the Cascades. There are 10 species that are found the east of the Cascades. That's from the Cascade Mountains east and not found in western Washington, but we have seven that are pretty well composite throughout the state. You're, you're might, you might run into them in Ponderee County as well as Mount Vernon or someplace like that. So uh, this is kind of how this runs. Uh, now, the dorsal surfaces of our butterflies are basically kind of drab. They're still, this is my favorite group, so I, I don't want to tear them down because I really love them. I, Favorite group of butterflies in the world are hair streaks. But in the state of Washington, when we get into the uh, temperate areas, we find that the dorsal surfaces are not as colorful as maybe we'd like them to be. They're usually shades of brown and orange, and there are very few of any markings on the hair streaks on the dorsal surface. Very few markings of any. Um, to identify these, we use primarily the ventral surfaces. But there are a few of ours that uh, the dorsal surface is very, very interesting, very unique, and you can use that almost exclusively. You don't need the ventral surface. But I would say for the most part, we examine the ventral surfaces, we look for the way the spots are, the way the lines are, the shades, the coloration, the patterns that form on these, and this allows us to identify each species. As uh, I wanted Dave to do a hair streak tonight because I want you guys to get a good feel for a larva. And boy, you can't get a better feel than what Dave can present with larva. I mean, he's, he's the expert. And uh, they do look kind of like little slugs. So we kind of use the kind of the catchphrase that they're slug-like. And they are lots of times green. I thought, oh, David, you're going to do me in tonight. The first one he shows me is brown. I said, thanks a lot. But he did show some green ones, didn't he, later on. And so you got to see it. But generally, kind of the rule of thumb is that they're kind of greenish, at least at the beginning stages, 
but uh, the hair streak larva, as you see from data, they, they change quite a bit from their one instar to the next. And sometimes they're very colorful in the end. Uh, the hair streaks are very difficult to follow in flight, generally. But I don't know of any that are really slow flying butterflies. Uh, they all are very erratic, too. They just are just every which way. So the way you're going to find hair streaks is basically nectar. You're going to look for them on larval food or the, on the adult food plants, and uh, this is the very best way you're going to see them. Well, our first oh, <laughs> that's not our first Washington hair streak, but I wanted to show you. I've been working with neotropical butterflies. I'm sorry, I threw, I threw, threw a few of them in here just to show you, but this is from Ecuador. I got back this fall from Ecuador, and I took this picture. Uh, this is the Arcus. Oh my God. You get into the, uh, the neotropics and uh, the hair streaks have reached the peak of evolution. They are absolutely gorgeous. And uh, this one is just one example of that. And these are large, so when we say our biggest one here may stretch out, if you, you know, stretch it to an inch and a quarter, this thing gets about two and a half, almost three inches. And uh, what you don't see is the top surface, which the rule of thumb in tropical species is generally some shade of blue. So most of the hair streaks that you find in the neotropics uh, have a blue color to them. Well, that's one. This is the Arcus. I think that's a beautiful, beautiful butterfly. This is another one uh, that comes from Ecuador. That, all of these came down the Amazon region. And uh, look at the beautiful stripes. Look at the nice tails. And see why they're called hair streaks? They have these streaking tails, and they're often in motion. When you see these butterflies sitting, their, hair, their, their tails, their hair streaks, are just in motion. They're flowing. Flowing, flowing, and uh, this is one example of that. But this is just a gorgeous uh, creature out of Ecuador. And then this one here is interesting too. It shows you how they've been so modified. Look at, look at the, look at the humpback on this thing. I mean, isn't that in, incredible for a butterfly to have that big hump on it like that? And so, and it's also got the flowing tails. Well, come on, let's uh, let's let's get to the task at hand. Yeah. Notice where all the lines are pointing to for the for the predators. Oh, yeah, 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 that's what I, I need to, to mention, too. A lot of hair streaks we find, I mean, I, when I photograph hair streaks down in Ecuador, I notice that the very back of them was missing, oftentimes. The very tail end was missing. Well, you can see why. Because the predators, I'll go back a minute here. When these things are moving, and there's a bird or a lizard, a lot of times it's lizards that are, that are the predators of these things. What are they going to be looking at and seeing? They're going to see these moving tails, and they're going to see that orange. There. A lot of them have the color right by the tail there, and that looks like an eye. And so when they strike the butterfly, where are they going to strike? The tail end. And so many times I was taking photographs, and I would find specimens that the tail was gone. <laughs> the butterfly is still flying. So, so right, that's a really good point to make. Okay, thanks. Well, let's start with our butterflies. The first one, I'm going to start with our rarest butterfly. This is called the golden hair streak. You will probably never see this butterfly. Unless you go where I tell you to go. And then you'll see it. Mm. But in Washington, it's extremely rare. This is the male. The male has, it's basically kind of a, a golden yellow color. It's a beautiful thing. But it has extensive brown coloring, as you can see, in the basal area and around the margins. And if you take a look at the female, the female is much lighter. Uh, it's more of a golden color, more typical, the name of it, the golden hair streak, because it looks kind of gold, but it also has a margin of some brown scaling as well. Now, if you take a look at the ventral surface, you'll find, and I'm going to give you some terminology that I'm going to use. I don't know if it's used by everybody, but it's going to be used by me. This line right here, um, the postmedial band is called, I'm going to call it the hair streak line. So if you just Pardon, when I talk about a hair streak line, I'm talking about this line right here that runs. Okay? And uh, then you also have some type of a line here, okay, which is a submarginal band. It's a submarginal band. And uh, we're going to be looking at these all the way through these butterflies because this is how we tell them apart. We not only tell them by color, by shading, but we also tell them about these bands how big they are, how they're shaped. Um, and you're going to see a lot of variation. And I think you'll find some very interesting things about hair streaks tonight. Another thing about the golden hair streak is, is neat, is you've got this almost metallic color of blue 
that comes out down at the bottom of this. And it's a very interesting because uh, a lot of people aren't aware of that in the golden hair streak. But getting back to uh, the vectoral surface, you notice that once again it's gold and yellow. Uh, the band is that have blue, blue or brown, I'm sorry, brown dashes that make this hair streak line. And uh, the little crescent, the marks here on the margins are almost non-existent. It's just a, a few remnants of it and on the, um, the forewing, there, there's really nothing at all there. So this is the golden hair streak. Now, this is one taken in, in the field, and this was taken at Clear Lake, Wasco County, Oregon. Okay? And that's where I want you to go if you want to find this butterfly. If you want to see this rarity, you really do. You want to go to a neat place, uh, take the highway behind Mount Hood, go to eastern Oregon. It's not far from Mount Hood, actually. I think it's about 30 miles, maybe. And, uh, and then go to uh, Clear Lake, it's Wasco County. And I will guarantee you this butterfly, if you go late in the summer, you have to go probably Labor Day weekend be the earliest, first part of September. If you go there, you will see this butterfly. But you're going to have to do a little bit of shaking the bushes because of its food plant, and I'll get to that in a second. But anyway, this shows you the ventral surface once again. Uh, these, the hair streak line shows up a little better, but it's these brown dashes. You've got a little bit more on this particular specimen, and you'll see variability in all these butterflies of the crescents there, so you can see them there. But you still have that golden yellow color to it, which is unique. You won't find that anywhere else with our hair streaks. Very rare butterfly. Why? Well, because the plant is rare. Casanopus is the, uh, uh, is the food plant, and uh, the first time I saw it was when I was in Oregon. And because I didn't know what it was. It looks, it looks uh, like a shrub. I, I, our expert plant man could describe it to you beautifully, but it's, uh, it, it's kind of, reminds me of kind of a rhododendron, but it's got these really prickly uh, seed cases on it. And, uh, but this is the exclusive food plant for this, this butterfly. Now, we have found it in Washington State. That's why I have it on the list here. It has been found here. But the problem is, Casanopus only has been found growing in two different places. And one of them is the uh, big lava bed down in Skamania County, which is almost Oregon. And the other one is Hood Canal. But I don't believe, at least I don't know, maybe do you know, Dave, if we've had any of these hair streaks found in Hood Canal. I don't believe there's any record of it, but the plant is there some places. But it's, it's a rare plant, therefore it's a rare butterfly. But you go down to Oregon, go down to Clear Lake, oh my goodness, this plant is around the whole lake. And, but the, the butterfly likes to hang in the plant. So you might walk there and say, oh, I don't see this butterfly. Bob said it's all over the place. Take a stick and whack the bush and you'll see them flying out. They usually are active in the morning and they're usually active in the late afternoon. During midday, they usually sit in the bush. So if you're there at noon, for example, and can't find it, shake the bush, go to another one, shake the bush. They'll fly from one bush to the other, and then you get a good chance to see these. But you want to go late. This is a late butterfly. A lot of people have their nets all hung up for the winter when this thing is just coming out. You know, you start on Labor Day for the Golden Hair Street. This is when you're starting to look for it. One thing about the food plant, the underside of the leaf is golden like the butterfly. Oh, so I didn't know that. Thank you, sir. Golden fuzz that would make a, a, an excellent camouflage for that same golden color. Oh yeah, and that would work great, because they do like to hide right in the shrub. They like to get oh, right in the underside of the leaf, I would think. They do, they do. Yeah, and they're very commonly there, so that's a really good point. Thank you very much for adding that. That's very helpful. And the eggs, larvae, and pupary are also all gold. Oh, well that makes it really great. That's really great. They on the underside yeah. too. Yeah. Okay, uh, the coral hair streak is our second one. This is another kind of uncommon hair streak. I, I don't know, I think I put rare down here. I don't know if I'd call it rare, but it's, it's a butterfly you never see in groups. I mean, it's one that you go, every time I'm in the field and see it, I say, oh, great, you know, a coral hair streak. That's exciting. Why? Because it may be the only one I see all day. You just don't see them often, unless you go to Sun Lake State Park. And then you'll see them abundantly if you go at the right time. And I'll tell you more about that later. But anyway, coral hair streak. Uh, it's all brown on the top. Very typical of our temperate uh, uh, hair streaks. Very brown. The male is dark brown. Oh, by the way, I'm going to point out this too. For you people, the new people, maybe not know this. You see these little white spots up here? These are agroponium scales, and they're, uh, they're male scent glands. They release pheromones and attract females. And so you can usually tell hair streaks apart, male and female by seeing that. The unfortunate thing is 
Some of the males don't show it very well. Either it's not colored, different from the rest of the wing, or it's covered in a fold. Sometimes the wing has a little tiny fold in it and it, uh, it's not visible. But a lot of times it is, and so if you ever do see those little marks on a, on a hair streak, you know it's a male. Here's the female. The female has a little more color to it than the male does. Some of the uh, what we call coral spots from underneath you can see come through here, and then you can also see some more of this uh, orange kind of color uh, on the top surface. The ventral surface is where it, of course, gets its name because they have these beautiful, gorgeous coral spots along the uh, submarginal band. And uh, normally you have to use the big crescents here, but in this case, the crescents are little and the orange spots dominate. And you can see the orange goes all the way up. Uh, black spot, the hair streak line is well developed in this butterfly. As you can see, the black spots, and they're kind of fringed with white, white to kind of gray color on them, and uh, they're, they're brown underneath. But uh, this is another gorgeous thing. And this butterfly, uh, well, let's get to that. This butterfly is addicted to milkweed. This is where you're going to find it. If you want to see the coral hair streak, go in eastern Washington when the, when the milkweed is in full bloom. And if you look at enough milkweed, I will guarantee you'll see this butterfly if you go at the right time. And of course, you're talking about June. Uh, I'd say the best time is probably June, late June in, into July, because you're probably the best time to see it. I know that when you get records of these things, sometimes they span all kinds of months, but but I've had most success seeing these in uh, late June to early July is when I've seen most of the ones I've seen. But if you go to Sun Lake State Park, and I say the first weekend after July, maybe right after July 4th, and you just drive along the road back to uh, Dry Falls Lake, stop along the road and take a look at all this milkweed in there by the tons. I mean, it just it grows abundantly in, in Sun Lakes. And you just study those heads, I will guarantee you, you'll find this butterfly. I've seen as many, four or five of these things on one head. And you don't see that anywhere else. I mean, that's the only place I have ever, in all my years of studying butterflies, and it's been a lot of them, that's the only place I've seen this butterfly in abundance, is Sundays. And I have found them other places, widely spread, but uh, that's where I've seen them uh, most abundantly. Uh, larval food plants are of the rose family. There's quite a few that are listed. Uh, David will give you probably some specific names. In fact, if you have any uh, questions on larva, if you hold it maybe till the end, you can ask David, because he's raised all of these. And so he may look up here and say, well, we haven't found this and that, whatever. I'm going by the records that, that I've collected through literature, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're here just in Washington. It could be the Pacific Northwest. But uh, they, these are all members of the uh, of the rose family uh, trees that seem to be uh, the food plant for this butterfly. But they are so addicted to milkweed, if you want to find one of these, that's what you look for. Uh, look on milkweed. In fact, <laughs> over by, uh, by Clem, I was looking actually for a sylvan hair streak. I mean, you mentioned the sylvan hair streak. I was looking for it, and I saw this head of milkweed, and it was just in full bloom, and I said, oh, I'm just going to go over and look at it. Sure enough, there's a coral hair streak on it. <laughs> So even there, uh, so that you might find them anywhere, but uh, but the good, uh, best place is over in the sunrise. The next one is the bear's hair streak. The bear's hair streak is one of these butterflies you can identify from the, the dorsal surface. Uh, that's all you need. You don't need anything else. Because the leading edge of this butterfly, we call this the leading edge here of the forewing, is that got that thick, 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 dark brown scaling. It's our only hair streak that has this. It's the only one. So uh, if you find one that uh, has that really thick leading edge, which continues on the margins, you have got a bear's hair streak. But you can also look at the, the ventral surface. It's also different. It's brown, but it's also got uh, the hair streak line of very dark brown to black here. And look at the outline of white. But the thing that's most interesting is, it's not just that it's a complete hair streak line, but it's got a secondary one as well. If you look, you'll notice that there's also kind of a secondary series of marks inside. And this is kind of unique. There's not a lot of our hair streaks that have that. So that, that makes it uh, kind of unique. Also, David mentioned this little patch of, uh, of uh, bluish uh, color. This is very common in a lot of our hair streaks down in here. And then, of course, uh, you've got the, uh, the margin the submarginal 
spots as well there with some pretty good sized crescents that you see here. These crescents build up. And so uh, it's pretty well developed, and you're going to find this varies considerably. Some are well developed and some uh, are not. But the hind wing, is that the sort of a trace of a hair streak on the edge? No, no. I, I think this is a, this is a damaged piece, uh, and it just isn't, isn't perfect. Uh, this is just bristles here. Uh, there's no, there's no, yeah, and I need to mention that too. Uh, not all of our hair streaks have, have tails or hair, hair streaks. The, the, uh, the coral hair streak did, or the golden hair streak did, the, the coral hair streak did not. And so uh, you're going to find this a, a mixed bag. Some have the hair streaks and some don't. And this is even in the uh, neotropic zone too, that, that falls through. So well, you have more of them, but the, uh, the hair streaks, but not all of them do. Okay, where are you going to find this thing? Bitter brush. Look for antelope bush. This is our animal brush. This is where you find it. Uh, I believe it's, it's the only uh, food plant that it has. Am I safe in saying that? I, we haven't found anything else, have we? No. Uh, bitter brush is where you're going to look for it. And it stays close to the plant. Here's another one where you want to rattle the bush a little bit. When they're out, I know I was over there one late June, and I was along uh, uh, between Cleo and Ellensburg. I took the, the road along the uh, Yakima River there. And there was... Uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, bitter brush up in there, and I, I took my net handle, actually, and I just kind of beat the brush, and that's where I was getting them to come out, and I could see them. And then they go right from one bush to another, because a lot of times they'll sit right in that, that shrub, and, and you just won't see them fly. So sometimes you have to kind of entice them to do that. Uh, it has kind of a large distribution. It's a, mainly a central Washington butterfly, but if you look at the records in our state, that they, it's found very widely in many different places. But once again, it's going to be pretty well, you know, uh, located where the animal uh, brush is or the bitter brush. brush. This is where it's going to be. Uh, drier areas in the eastern Cascades is where you're going to look for this. When do you go? June. Uh, I would say late June uh, into July. Uh, that's the time I've seen the adults uh, at their peak. Um, you might be able to see them earlier, you might see them later, but I think that's the peak time. They're also erratic, fast flying. So you don't see them usually go very, very well from one bush to another, but they will. They'll fly from one to the other, and then you can take a look at them when they're on the shrub. The next one is a half moon hair streak. And this one I want you to take careful note of because this can be confused with the blue, and I'll explain that to you as we go along here. Uh, but the half moon hair streak, notice it's all brown, and there's no markings on the, the dorsal surface. It's entirely Brown. Okay, keep that in mind. Entirely brown. That's very, very important to identifying this butterfly. The ventral surface, if you look at it, uh, has a nice hair streak line, and it has these nice spots that are ringed in white. Does that remind you of a blue that we have? <laughs> Bottom walls blue has that same marking. So if you look at the ventral surface of this, you might say, well, wow, this is like an old, in fact, the old police CHA was that they look like an old, worn blue. Well, actually, they don't. First of all, the brown color of this is brown. That is brown. The whole butterfly is brown. Brown, brown, brown. No other color. And uh, also, if you look at this thing, it always looks like a 5 o'clock shadow. Every time I see this butterfly, I say, why didn't this butterfly shave? It always looks rough on the back. And this is where it gets the... Uh, you know, uh, its name of being so bad. I mean, it looks like this thing's been out for six months. So actually, this, is, this was a fresh specimen, probably mint. This is the way they look. And uh, so, but it is confused with blue. This is another, uh, another uh, sample of it showing the, the, uh, the ventral surface. You notice, once again, the ringed uh, hair streak line, once again, which would confuse it with the bottom walls blue. And they're about the same size, too. Okay, now, one way that you can tell this from the other, <laughs> I'm going to take the easy way out, is where its location is. Now, I don't know, I have to talk to you about this sometime, David, about food plant. I've always, always found this butterfly associated with big sagebrush or artemisia. Always, in no other place. It's always been on the shrub. In fact, when I took a group, the last year, I don't know if anybody went up to Sinalhekin with me on our field trip. 
Did you go up there when we went up there and beat the bushes up there to find that? And we found them, didn't we? Yeah. They were in this big sagebrush. Now, to my knowledge, that's not a larval food plant, is it? Lupin. Yeah, it's lupin. But this is where you find them. I mean, if I'm going to take a group out and look for this butterfly, at the right time, I'm going to take them to those shrubs and I'm going to have them beat the brush. Because this is where we're going to find them. They're going to be in the shrubs. And uh, it's just this way it is. So it's really interesting that they really like that, that shrub, even though they're actually not using it for nectaring or they're not using it for the larva. So it's a, it's a real curious thing about this butterfly. So anyway, telling it apart from the, the blue, I'm going to go back a second here. If you have a bottom wall blue, even if it's a female, the females have a tendency to have a lot of brown on them. The males, of course, would be no problem because it would be blue. But the females will have brown on them. But I don't care how brown the female is, it's going to have blue on it. And most of the blue is going to hang in here. You're going to see some blue. You're always going to see some blue. Never with this hairstyle. Never any blue. So that, that's what I'm telling you. Also, the bottom wall is blue. If you look at the dorsal surface, you're going to see a crescent mark up here. There's a crescent mark, which is very typical of blues. Not on this one. No crescent mark. So if you use no crescent mark, all brown, and you find it on Artemisia, you've got this butterfly. Okay? That's what you've got to remember in the field trips. Look for it. And uh, do you all know what that shrub is like? You all know what I'm talking about? It, it's a great, it's a great big sagebrush. It's very green. You know, it, it often grows with bitter brush. The two can be side by side. They can be in the same area, but they're different plants. Okay. Now, the California hair streak. I don't need to say much about it because Dave did it all for me, so that's great. Thanks, Dave. But the California hair streak. Here's a male. Notice it's a male. He's got these marks up there. You see them up there. Scent glands. Uh, the male has a couple of orange spots on the dorsal surface, and pretty much like the female, except the female usually has more orange. Generally, they'll have another patch of orange or two. Looks like four if you're on this particular one. Tails are well developed on this one. Here is a hair streak that has hair streaks, so very good to see. Let's look at the ventral surface. David already told you all this, so we'll kind of go over it kind of fast. But there's some things I want you to focus on, and I want you to focus on those, those orange uh, submarginal spots. Those are very, very critical. The California hair streak has orange virtually going all the way up the entire way to the top. You're going to see, now I, I know you probably would find a specimen and say, ah, you're wrong, there's one that doesn't have orange at the very top. Okay, well, I won't say this in 100%, but I would say the typical California hair streak specimen you're going to see is going to have these orange spots going all the way up to the top. So keep that in mind, okay? It's very important. Notice how well the hair streak line is up. Isn't that a nice, it has a nice big black spots ringed in uh, white to gray? Uh, it's, a, it's a gorgeous thing. One thing though about this photo, it, it isn't as good as I wanted to show you, is that normally that ground color is brown. This looks awfully gray and uh, kind of takes away from what I wanted to say because most of the ones that I've looked at are really more brown than they are gray. All right. Here's a hair streak with tails, a uh, central Washington butterfly with a wide distribution. We have records for it all over eastern Washington. Uh, it's, uh, it, it favors brushy canyons. Uh, you're going to find it where the oaks and pines and willows are. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it feeds on uh, bitter brush, and you're, if you're lucky, you'll see at the same time you find bear's hair streak. I've seen it over there in um, my Cleolum. Uh, I was beating the brush for various hair streak, and whoop, all of a sudden out comes the California hair streak. Uh, they sometimes fly together. I think the California hair streak will fly maybe a little bit later, so they may overlap, but uh, maybe the later you are, the more you're going to likely to see the California hair streak than you are the bears. But uh, I have seen them fly together over there. Uh, June through July, late June. Uh, into July, they fly well into July, and uh, as you can see, it has a number of food plants that uh, that it feeds on. The next one is a silver hair streak, which also David enlightened us to. 
Um, one thing I want to mention about the Sylvan Hair Street, first of all, if you look at the dorsal survey, you can say, oh, that's a California Hair Street. Well, yes and no. Uh, it does have these orange spots, like the California Hair Street. And, it's going to look, and it has the tails, and it's going to look just like it. But look at the overall scaling on the surface. Do you notice the gray kind of tinge to it? California Hair Street has a brown look. It's always brown. This one will have kind of a grayish, kind of overriding uh, kind of feature. If you compare the two right beside each other, you can see one is really brown, the other one is basically kind of grayish brown. This is one way you might be able to tell from the dorsal, but I wouldn't trust the dorsal surface at all. I would not use it if I was trying to identify it. But look at this. <laughs> Here's the vertical surface. Now, is that like a California hair streak? Not at all. But I picked the easiest subspecies. This is Sylvanus. This is the one that favors really wet areas. You find them around wells that are by marshy areas, irrigation ponds, the creeks, whatever in eastern Washington, central Washington. They're very, uh, well, I wouldn't say they're really common, but I, I have seen them uh, fairly commonly over there. Um, but notice how silvery white this ventral surface is. And remember, we talked about California hair streak having those red spots all the way up the whole wing? Well, not so. But so it is. It might have one spot on the orange. And that's it. But this subspecies is an easy one. That's a cop out. I gave you that one first. Let me give you the hard one that Dave mentioned. Okay, look at that. Uh huh. And this is a uh, California hair streak? No. No, this is a silver hair streak also. This is the subspecies Nutka, which flies later generally and is actually probably more distributed. Uh, they're both well feeders, but this one I, I have found it in more drier areas. I, the Sylvanus. Where I have seen it, at least, my experience with it, it is always associated with water somewhere. Not this one. This one, I found it on the side of the road, Nectrion Dog Bay, down in Skamania County. So it, uh, it, it varies, and it's a lot, a lot later flyer. I think you'll see it more like in the middle of July uh, than you will the, uh, the Sylvanus, the other subspecies. Now, how you're going to tell this one apart is, once again, the orange. Follow the orange. The orange goes up uh, part way. To here, maybe a little bit there, and if you stretch your imagination, you might say, Oh, I see a little orange here, but it's not definite. The orange is pretty incomplete, it's uh, it, it's really restricted to the very lower part of the ventral hind wing. And this is what separates the subspecies. So I know it's subtle and it might be difficult, but um, that is the main thing. Also, the overall grayish tendency of the brown color of the wing, too, it, it's, it's just not quite all brown like the. California hair streak. So I don't know whether that'll help you or not. This is a difficult one. There are several hair streaks that are really hard to identify in the field. This is one of them, but uh, also uh, look at where you're finding it. Uh, this will help. If you find it on bitter brush, it's going to be a California hair streak, okay? So you know that because that's its food plant. This one, you're going to be more likely to see it nectaring on plants along the side of the road, uh, you know, this sort of thing. But it's in wells. Um, if you get to a patch of levels, then you might find this one in there. So if one's on levels, one's on bitter brush, you've got, you got the difference right there. Okay, this is the Hill Street, uh, Silver Hair Street female. I just want to show you how much red can be in the, the, uh, the hair streak. So you can't use the dorsal, dorsal surface at all. Okay, and we covered everything here pretty much. Uh, wellows east of Cascades, late June through July is uh, where you want to uh, look for this butterfly. The next one is a hedge, hedgerow a hair streak, and this is an other easy one. This is easy because the ground color of this is reddish. It's reddish brown. It's our only hair streak that is red brown. And it really is evident. If you look and see this in the field flying, you can see immediately this red color shows up when it flies. And so you know you've got something different here. The, the tails are a little smaller. You can see they're a little bit shorter, but they are there. But this red, uh, red color is really all you really need to be able to identify this. But let's look at the ventral surface anyhow. Very brown. Uh, you can see the hair streak line is well developed with very dark brown spots outlining in white. Uh, the crescents are fairly well developed, but there's not a lot of spots other than that. There, it's pretty much just these crescents. Uh, you do have, once again, this typical hair streak spot that David was telling about um, with this kind of a bluish uh, gray color. It's very, very typical of hair streaks. This is the Central Washington butterfly, and this one's a later flyer too. Uh, you're going to find it open canyons and hills of eastern, the eastern Cascades, particularly. But it's, it's an eastern Washington butterfly or Central Washington butterfly. 
uh, it, it feeds on CNOFIS. So once again, you're going to be looking in areas where it's kind of uh, uh, wooded, but look for a CNOFIS that's going to be in the wood plant. If it's uh, along the side of the roads or whatever, there's a good chance you'll run into this. It's a late flying butterfly. I found it as late as, I mean, I was down at Oak Creek, and this thing was abundant in the first week in August. Uh, just walking along the creek and, and looking at uh, pearly everlasting. Oh, it loves pearly everlasting and dog meat. If you find uh, a place that has that in eastern Washington and uh, even in August, uh, you're, you're going to find this if there's any sea and this around. This butterfly will be there and because uh, it's just totally addicted to the pearly everlasting and dog meat. You can find it very commonly. The next one is one of our three green hair streaks. Now this will be nice because you say, ah, oh, Finally, I can see something that's kind of distinct. But the trouble is, all three of these hair streaks are brown on top, so you can't tell them apart. So we have to use other methods to tell them apart. Of course, obviously, you can see this is a male. No question there, is there? And uh, the ventral surface of this uh, will give you what it is. It's green, as we suggested. Uh, the one thing about this that will help you is it flies in western Washington. The bramble hair streak flies in western Washington. Um, if any of you know the Tahuti area, I know Heidi usually takes a trip over there. This is one of the butterflies she finds over there on that trip. She, she has that as one of her key species that she's looking for. Uh, this butterfly will be there. It's an early flyer, uh, April. Look forward in April. But I want you to be able to identify it not just because it's western Washington. That's really enough. That's all you need to know. But I want you to look at the hair streak line here. You notice how it kind of <laughs> kind of disappears on us, doesn't it? It starts out all right, but then it gets down here and we got three spots. And that's pretty consistent for the Bramble Harris Ridge, because they have just three spots. And uh, so it kind of, where is it? It's gone. And look at submarginal, nothing. There's no crescents, nothing out here, which is, you know, usually there's a lot of hair streaks that have that. So, so it's kind of unusual that way. But, but uh, remember these three spots, which are what's left of the hair streak line that you find in the brown. There's another one uh, photograph, and this was, this was filmed over Mason County, and that's the place where I'd, I'd have you go to look for it. If you're going to go, go, go over that way. This happened to be pho photographed in an old Christmas tree farm. Uh, Mason County, of course, is famous for its Christmas trees, and if you go along the Christmas tree areas where the trees are pretty small, you see salal and all kinds of shrubs in there. Hey, there's lotus in there too, which is its food plant. Go in there, walk in there, walk around those farms, you'll find this butterfly. So it's really pretty common in Mason County. Okay, Western Washington butterfly. You can also find it down in Thurston, Lewis, and Clark counties as well. It has been found there, but I think the most common place to find it is Mason, and that's probably where you should look if you seriously want to find this butterfly. Look for a starboard food plant lotus, which is in the pea family, and uh, so it kind of looks something like lupin. I mean, you might be confused if you don't plants very well. You might look at it and think it's a lupin. But uh, it's kind of similar to the way it grows. But uh, this is what it'll feed on. Uh, now, there's a subspecies of this, Organensis, that flies in eastern Washington. But I'm not going to dwell on it because you'll probably never see it. Uh, the only places I've seen it, I've only seen it once, and the only place I found it was up by Sadis Pass in Klickitat County, just over the Yakima uh, border in the Klickitat County. And I saw actually one specimen, is all I've seen of this. But it does fly in that area. I believe there's been records even in the, uh, yeah, in the uh, Blue Mountains, but I'm not positive on that. But Oregonensis is basically a, an Oregon butterfly, obviously, because of its name. This is really not a Washington butterfly, but it can be found there. So that's, a, that's another subspecies of it. But the one you're going to find is going to be uh, the bramble, which is going to be in western Washington. Now, here's the western green hair streak. And I got the dorsal surface of that, and you're going to say, oh, yeah. Well, they all look the same. All the hair streaks look the, the green hair streaks look the same. They're all brown. And here's the female. It's brown also. But the ventral surface is different. You're going to say, well, how different? Yeah, the hair streak line is, is almost non existent. I have specimens of this that have absolutely no markings on the hair streak line at all. Zero. It's all green. Now, there are some that have some. Like you look and say, aha, I see some right here. There's one here and one here. You might have a few spots, but they definitely won't be the, the definite three spots that you see in the bramble. Well, besides what we're talking about the bramble, 
This flies in eastern Washington. This doesn't even fly in western Washington. So you don't have to be confused with it. Don't worry about it. Uh, this is an eastern Washington butterfly, and its habitat is totally different from the other hair streaks. First of all, it's a later flyer. Most of our hair streaks fly in April. And when you guys go, how many of you guys are going to Snibley? Okay, good. Well, now you're going to be looking for the next one, the third one, which is the Sheridan's hair streak. Now, you're going to the end of March, right? <laughs> that's pretty early, but that's when that butterfly comes out. It, its peak is April. So, so the, the green hair streaks are generally very early flying. Not this one. This one is not. We found this in the Sinlihican. Were you with us when we found this? Uh, it wasn't, uh, who was it found it? One of our, I don't remember who it was now, but they found it on that ridge, and it was in June. We found this in June. A green hair streak in June? It's unheard of. Well, it can happen with this one. The Washington hair, or the Western, I'm sorry, green hair streak uh, actually uh, is much later flyer than the other two hair streaks. They're Mesa, April. This is going to be May into June. So that, that'll help you with this a lot. In fact, uh, talking about Schneebly Canyon, if you put off going to Schneebly till May, the end of May, you might see them both. Now, if you go down in the canyon bottom, if you find a Sheridan's, what shape is it going to be in? Pretty ratty. I mean, you're going to see it, but uh, is this a green hair streak or not? Is there any green on it? Yeah, it looks like it. Pretty ratty. Pretty well gone. But if you go on the ridge, if you've been to Schneebly before, you go up on the ridge, oh, that's where the western green hair streak is. He's up on top. He's, he's not down in the canyon. He's up on top, and he likes that rocky ridge area. That's where you'll find him, and he'll be mint. If you go in May, you'll see this thing, beautiful mint shape. So you'll find that. And it's widespread, as we said. We saw it in Sinlahican, and uh, we've seen it down in, you know, Kittitas County. So it, it's quite widespread. Now here's one that is almost totally without any markings on it. See, and this, this was taken up in Shenandoah County, by the way. This was taken up on the ridge in Maine. Okay, almost no markings. <coughs> north of the east of the Cascade, central Washington, and into the Blue Mountains. This one flies. Late spring. Late May into June, uh, and the right ridges we talked about, uh, and a swoop. Sheridan's hair straight. This is what you're going to see, Schneider. So let's look at this now. Notice dorsal brown. Are you surprised? No. Yes. <laughs> but here's how you're going to recognize this one. We have a hair streak line. Yay. Yay! A green hair streak with a hair streak line. Can you believe it? We've got one right here. Still don't have any some marginal spots, but we do have this hair streak line, and it's pretty well developed, especially in this particular subspecies, which is Neo perplexum. This is the northern range one. This is the one you will not see in Schneider. This one, uh, if you want to see this, oh, there's a huge colony of it up in Badger Mountain, east east Wenatchee. If you go up there uh, in April. Uh, there's a, it just flies in the wild area. You want to get away from cultivation. Don't go anywhere where there's, there's any farms or anything. But if you get up there in the mountains where it's just wild, this is where you'll find Sheridan's uh, hair streak. And uh, this Neo Perplexa flies north, up into Okanagan, from actually northern Kittitas County northward. And, uh, but it has a hair streak line. Now, the one you're going to see is Newcomer, right, which is the one that is go south. It's going to go more towards Oregon from Kittitas County. You notice that the line sort of goes backwards again. It's, it's there, but it's not as definite. It's not as bright and it's not as complete as the subspecies Neoperplexa. It has, it has the best uh, of, the, uh, of the hair streak line. So this is our third green hair streak. So we have three of them. Now you set on them. Can you, you not mistake them? One is Western Washington in the Bramble. Okay? So if you go in the over there in Mason County, you see a green hair streak, it's a brown one. But the other two hair streaks are Eastern Washington, but they're probably the flight, uh, flight times are going to be different. The Sheridan's is going to be early. If you see it in April, that's what you're going to have. If you see it in May, you're probably going to have the Western hair streak, especially if you're climbing on ridges. If you're up higher, you're going to have the Western hair streak. If you're lower in the canyon bottoms, you're going to have Sheridan's. So I hope this will help a little bit. I know that's overgeneralizing, but sometimes you get overlaps. But I think that is a pretty safe way to identify these. Okay, uh, I went over all this information, I think. Now, we finally get a neotropical specimen. I look at this and say, oh, 
This looks like this should be in the Amazon. This is our most beautiful hair streak. And this is the thicket hair streak. And it's blue on top. It's our only blue Washington State hair streak. Now you go down to Ecuador and Peru, and you'll find most of the hair streaks are blue on top. That is commonplace. But this is one that actually is blue. And of course, it has some dark scaling around the edges. Nice tails, double tail. So it's a, it's a beautiful thing. The ventral surface has a hair streak line that is a hair streak line. I mean, this one really shows up. And another thing that makes it look neotropical is this right here. We don't see that in our hair streaks up here. But you get in the neotropics and you've got this real jagged bottom to the hair streak line, which is very typical of neotropical hair streaks. So I, I'm almost thinking that this is misplaced. This should be in Central or South America, and here we have it, but we're lucky we have it in Washington. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. Now, another thing I want to mention about the, because we're going to compare it to Johnson's hair streak, which is the only thing we can be fused with. Actually, we can't be confused with it, because Johnson's hair streak doesn't fly where this does. But anyway, it looks it can be confused with it. You have dark scaling here, and you notice you have a lighter band here, and then you have another band here with a lot of orange that, that uh, here, that is kind of flows through this band. So you actually have three different colors here, plus this really bright white line. This is very typical of the thicket hair streak. Here's another picture of the thicket hair streak showing that obvious white hair streak line that it has. Okay, uh, this is, uh, you know, I, I think it's our most beautiful hair streak. I mean, that's, that's my number one hair streak as far as beauty goes. East of the Cascades, where are you going to look for it? Uh, look, first of all, look for it in May. I would say May, mid-May, even into June, but better probably May, late May. Look for it in a ponderosa pine. Uh, like you go up roads um, that are in eastern Washington where there's pine belts in there, drive up the roads, and they'll commonly be right on the roadside. Okay? Uh, you'll see them just, they, they'll, 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 they'll mud or they'll just be sitting. I've seen them just, just sitting on the gravel road in May. And this is most commonly where I've run into these. And, but I've seen them as, as far up as Oregon. So these extend all the way up into Okanagan County, all the way through central Washington. They're not that uncommon, but you have to hit it right. I would say May is a good time, and uh, it's got to be it's got to be ponderosa pine. And you're going to say, well, why? Well, because that's where its larval food plant is. It feeds on dwarf mistletoe, which feeds on the branches of uh, it's a parasitic plant on the branches of uh, ponderosa pine. So this is where you're going to find it, and it's a beautiful. I think this is really our most beautiful hair streak. Now the Johnson's hair streak. This is my favorite hair streak in Washington. And uh, why is because I'm always in awe of this butterfly. The first time I saw this butterfly, I was above uh, Lake Cushman. I went up the gravel road on the left-hand side. The other right-hand side is, uh, well, Peter shakes it. He, he, he knows. I took him up. I took Peter up there to, to look for Johnson's hair streak. And we were successful, weren't we, Peter? Yeah. But funny. anyway, the first time I saw this, it fluttered down to a wet area along the side of the road. And I saw this brown butterfly. I says, what is this? I have never seen an emphalid like this. I thought it was an emphalid. I didn't think it was a hair streak because it was so big. This thing is an inch and, a, inch and a quarter across. It's a big hair streak. And I saw that. I got close. I said, oh, this is Johnson's hair streak. I had no idea of the size. I was there to look for Johnson's hair streak, but I had no idea they were that big. This is a pretty large hair streak. And uh, but on the, on the uh, dorsal surface, it has orange on it. A little bit of orange flush in it, but it's basically brown, as you see there. Uh, the female is a lot lighter in color, and it's kind of pretty because you can see the outlines of the veins and all, and uh, so it's a much lighter, lighter kind of orangish brown uh, color that you have. Um, and this, by the way, this is an extremely rare butterfly, as you know. I mean, this, you, some, I, how many of you have ever seen Johnson's hair streak? I know Peter has, and you've seen it. David. Very few people have seen this kind of thing. They just don't run into it. You have to know where to go, uh, what to look for to find it, but, uh, but uh, it is there. Um, this is the ventral surface. You say, wait a second, that's a thicket hair streak. Well, wait a second. This, is, this flies only in western Washington. So it can't be the thicket. The thicket only flies in eastern Washington. So you're safe. 
You don't have to worry about anything. But I will point out some of the differences. Uh, you got a nice hair straight line here too. It's very nice. It's not as nice as the thicket. I think the thicket is much brighter. But it's a good one. It's a good one. It, it, it you know it figures in maybe number two. Uh, you also have notice you don't have the two bands here that you did in the uh, thicket. You have basically a dark band here and a kind of a light band here. Uh, so you don't have that division. And uh, you have several of the blue uh, spots in here. Um, and also you have, uh, I didn't show you on the thicket, but the sub-arginal uh, chevrons go all the way up the hind wing in the thicket airstreak in the Donut Johnsons. So there, I mean, there's some subtle, you might say, well, that's kind of picky little differences. But the main thing is Western Washington. And the problem is with this butterfly that uh, it's, it's a real rarity. It's only found where you have old growth hemlock. And as you know, our, our old growth forests are getting lesser and lesser all the time. Therefore, we expect this, this butterfly also to reduce in numbers. When we cut down old growth forests, we're, we're destroying the habitat for the Johnson Hair Street. So this is a one, if you don't have this reason already, it's another reason to push for preserving old growth forests. Uh, we have many reasons, but this is another one that you can tack onto the list. Because the, the dwarf mistletoe, this is another mistletoe feeder, isn't that funny? The thicket looks a lot like it, but it's in mistletoe that grows in eastern Washington. This grows on mistletoe in western Washington. And they look very similar, but they're totally different butterflies. One's blue on top, and this one's brown. But anyway, um, this is its habitat. And the best place to see it, if any of you want to see this, I took Peter up there once, so he knows. He's a believer. Um, you just go up to Lake Cushman and go up to the left-hand side, go across the dam. If any of you are familiar with Lake Cushman, go across the dam, go up the gravel road, and keep looking back until you can't see the lake anymore. When you can't see the lake anymore, park your car, walk the road, and just be looking at nectaring plants or looking at the, uh, the wet areas. <coughs> and uh, if you're there at the right time, you, know, start, you can start Memorial Day weekend. Into, we were there about the middle of June, I think it was about June 15th. But it was a really warm day. Yeah, it was a really nice warm day. But it was middle of June. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any trouble finding them. They were there. But uh, they're not really abundant, but you will find them along that stretch there. They, I've always seen them there. So, and this is a rare butterfly. This is really worth almost making a trip for. But please check the weather for the Olympics when you go. Because uh, you know how fickle the Olympics are. And if you go up there, I had been up there when it was sunny in Gig Harbor. I was driving over there. It was a beautiful sunny day. As I got closer to the Olympics, I noticed clouds. By the time I got to Lake Cushman, I was in clouds. And so I waited it out for a couple hours, and I said, well, maybe it'll get sunny. It never did get sunny. Clouds were the whole time. So anyway, rare butterfly. The next one is the, uh, the Cedar Hair Street. This looks like a lot like the Johnson's hair streak, but it's much smaller. This is a much smaller butterfly. It also has the brown with the orange uh, spots on it. Uh, on it. Uh, and the female looks very much like the Johnson's. You're gonna say, well, they look very similar. These are much smaller. I mean, once you're in there and you're looking at both of these species, you'll say, how would I ever get them mixed up? The Johnson is such a bigger uh, hair streak than this is. But the ventral surface will tell you. Uh, the ventral surface, when these are fresh, they have the most beautiful lavender color that extends out from this basal area. They're just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the Johnson Hair Street doesn't have it. It doesn't have any lavender at all. It's all brown. And uh, so, so this is really pretty. Also, you can see the extensive blue spots that it has going up the, uh, the high wing here. Uh, but the Hair Street line otherwise looks pretty similar. So the main thing is size and also numbers. I think we figured a ratio of what, about 10 to 1? When or, we were there. or even 1 to 20 maybe. Maybe 1 yeah. to 20. Yeah. Uh, we would see like 20 of these to every one Johnson's. So Johnson's are much rarer uh, and they're bigger. I mean you can immediately you see them just by size and nothing else. You just you can tell them apart. But, uh, but look for the lavender uh, scaling here. Especially if they're fresh. If they're, if, they're, if they're worn you're not going to see that as well. But they're really pretty when they come out fresh. Okay. Western Red Cedar. Cedar hair streak, okay. Now there's some problems with this, and I'm not sure if they, all of them have been resolved. Are they still calling the subspecies on the juniper forest berry eye, or are they not, they're not, they're not dividing them anymore? They're, they're dividing them at the subspecies level, but they're calling the one on juniper 
Mir Kalposiva. Oh, okay, and then a new name. Yeah. Okay, okay. I knew they were working with it. I knew they weren't uh, set on it. But if you go over to the Juniper Forest, you guys know where that is over in Pasco? Okay. Uh, you'll see uh, one of the cedar hair streaks over there that uh, if you go in May, yeah, I think the end of April even, I think you can see them. Can't you, David, on it for some more? Or, yeah, right around the end of April. Yeah, the end of April, 1st of May. Uh, it may be in the June, maybe. It depends on the year. But if you go over there, they're on the juniper there. And so they're, they're, they're very similar looking to the cedar hair streaks we have up at like in Cushman. But they are considered a unique population. Also, there's another unique population of the cedar hair streak that's in the northeastern part, Ponderay County. And I don't know what they've done with that or not. I think they've just left it alone. I know Guppy and, uh, and Shepherd had separated that into another subspecies. But anyway, I'm just telling you there's some confusions with this butterfly, things that probably still need to be worked out. But uh, we'll just call it the cedar hair streak and be happy with it. Whether you find that juniper forest or whether you find it, uh, say, this, I didn't find this in Gig Harbor. I, I often see this, I have a lot of cedar trees in my yard and uh, I find this right in Gig Harbor. So this is not an uncommon butterfly, the cedar hair streak. Whereas the Johnsons, I don't know, I probably have a heart attack or something in Gig Harbor. So. <laughs> uh, the brown elephant. Brown elephant. There are four elephants, and uh, just bear with me. I'm almost done with this. I know some of you are saying, "Well, this goes on forever, doesn't it?" Um, and there's four elephants. This is the first one, and this is the easiest one to tell. Uh, the elephants generally have their hind wing usually kind of folds in, almost looks like it's oriental. For some reason, it looks like a Aladdin's shoe or something. But uh, the elephants typically have this bending in of that hind wing. So that, that's one way to maybe kind of at least get an idea of that's what it is. Uh, this one has some orange, you can see the orange coloration with the brown. The brown has been such a theme tonight that I don't even have to mention it anymore. Most of them are going to be brown, as you know. Uh, the female has a little bit more of the orange, and this is also typical and be found all the way through the species I've shown you. The females are generally a little lighter, and they usually have more of the orange coloring, if there is coloring on them. Uh, but, you won't confuse this with any, any other hair strip. All you have to know is this characteristic right here. Look at this great big brown spot right here. That's all you have to know. You don't have to know anything else. I mean, there are other interesting things about it. Like, where's the hair streak line here? Are these part of the hair streak line? Or are these part of the submarginal spots? The designer of this butterfly didn't quite understand that there's supposed to be two bands. They kind of mesh them sort of, I guess, together. Uh, I mean, you might be able to sort them out, but I find it a little bit difficult. But that's not the important part. The point is this. You will never confuse this butterfly because of this uh, nice big brown spot on the ventral surface that you will see. And this is a spring butterfly. And this, this butterfly flies pretty much throughout the whole state of Washington. You're going to find it uh, just about anywhere you go. Uh, I think the only place it hasn't had any records for it is the heart of the Columbia Basin. But everywhere else, it's been found. No tails, but those projecting knobs. Uh, it uh, feeds on kinikinik, but also other food plants. I think it has a whole list of them. David, you can enlighten us sometime afterwards on all the food plants this thing eats. But I know that uh, kinikinik, the reason I say kinikinik is because that's what I reared it on. I reared it. I tried it to rear it on several things, and I couldn't rear it on anything but kinikinik. It loved kinikinik. Salam. I tried Salam. He, they, they would crawl off the Salam and go to the Kinnikinik. They would not eat the Salam. So I don't know why. Maybe it's the ones I have. They're finicky. But anyway, so I know. That's why I know for sure Kinnikinik is a good food, food plant for it. Uh, this is also a spring butterfly. This also I have in my yard in Gig Harbor. I'm always excited to see it. It comes out, uh, you know, in May. Usually May is when I see it in, in Gig Harbor. But this flight period is already June. So that, that's got to be helpful characteristic. The female is very light colored, as you can see. Uh, and also, you can also see that the separation here of the brown and the white in that fringe. And here's a, but this thing is just gorgeous when you see it in, in nature. The best place that I've run into is up at Reeser Creek, up at Reeser Ridge. You got you got to get up uh, where Cedar is. You got to get where the stone prop is. So if you go up the research, I, a lot of you have probably been there on field trips and research creek. That's one of our favorite spots. Wow, we go every year. But uh, you got to go up 
out of the canyon, you got to get up in the hills, you got to get where there's stone crop. When you start seeing the sedum, that's, that's when I look for this thing. When I first went, I kept driving, driving, and I walk around and say, oh, Do I see any stone crop here? Sedum. Aha! Sedum here! Okay, park the car. We're staying here. And then you walk around, and this is where you usually see it. This is a very early butterfly. The most abundant I've ever seen it was we had a warm week in March. Believe it or not, it was the last week in March, a few years back. And it was in like 70, 75 degrees over in Ellensburg in March. Can you imagine? And so I went over there, and this butterfly was just everywhere in the meadows. It was everywhere. And, uh, but I don't think that's typical. March usually, you know, doesn't have very many nice days. So I would say maybe April is probably a more, more uh, time to see it. But it will emerge early. If we get an, um, a warm spring, uh, you can see it. But look how gorgeous this thing is. It's got this beautiful coloration here, the nice clear streak line, and the patterns here are just, I, I just think it's a, it's a gorgeous thing. When you see it in nature, um, it, it's really quite a butterfly, a beautiful butterfly to behold. I tell you, it's just, it's worth seeing. But you want to get up into that area. There, it's, it's found in central Washington. Well, that's one here. Oh, that's another. Well, this one's taken, by the way, up in Oregon. So it has quite a range as well. This is way up in Okanagan County. Um, March through April. But <coughs> I would say the peak would be April, maybe into May. I don't know. It depends on the year, you know. It depends on what our weather's like. But uh, the higher you go in elevation, the later, of course, it's going to be. That's typical of all butterflies. Sedum, stone crop, this is what you look for. Uh, I have seen uh, the subspecies uh, Mossiae once, and it was by accident. Actually, I was taking my environmental biology class up to Mount Rainier. We were going to hike up to the Carbon Glacier, so we went up the carbon entrance of Mount Rainier. And we went up into this one meadow where there was some sedum in there, and I, I could not believe my eyes. I said, what? Now, this was, this was in late May. And here, this butterfly was flitting around in Mount Rainier National Park up in the Carbon uh, uh, River entrance. So it is found, this subspecies is found in western Washington. Uh, there's records for the Olympics as well. Uh, but basically, the, the subspecies you're going to see is going to be Trevorai, and that's going to be eastern Washington. And this is where the one you find up at Reeser, you know. So uh, it's, a, it's a gorgeous butterfly. It's worth seeing down its own, too. Sometime, if you have nothing else to do, you want to take a little trip over to Eastern Washington and take a look at it. This butterfly is our darkest brown one, and even though the photograph isn't all that great. This is a hoary elephant, and this is another beautiful thing. And uh, this one, uh, it's amazing. The distribution of this thing is, is something else. It's, it's, uh, it's found along the Puget Sound area, then it disappears from most places in the state until you get up into Okanagan County and eastward. And it all of a sudden appears again. And, uh, it, it's, it's amazing. The distribution of this is kind of strange. But this is uh, the hoary elephant. Uh, the, the ventral surface of it is the best way to till this. You have this really massive uh, coloration of uh, white to gray coloring. And when these things are mint, this is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the hair streak line is almost gone. The, the interface between the hair streak line and this is so mixed that it's, you, you just can't tell the two apart. And uh, this thing uh, feeds on uh, kinikinik, and uh, that's where you almost always find it. When I was doing the, the study for Waba in Johnson's Prairie, uh, every time we run into a good patch of kinikinik, it would be there. And uh, we ran into it, as well as the, uh, uh, another elephant, too, the uh, brown elephant. So this is the hoary elephant. There's another picture of the hoary elephant of kinikinik. Uh, I just have nothing else to add there. Sensei gray scaling, which is, it's just there's no interface to it. That's the thing that's amazing that you just don't see where the hair strip line is and where this scaling starts. It kind of blends and it makes it kind of unique. Oh, and then our easiest elephant. This is a slam dunk. Everyone can get this one. This is another large butterfly. This, this actually rivals the Johnson's hair streak for size. It's, it's a good inch, and maybe even more. It's a, it's a pretty good sized elephant. Flies in uh, eastern Washington and western Washington. And you can find it in western Washington if you know where any pine forests are. You have to go to pine forests. That's where it is. Stuart, did you, did you happen to see this down when you were working in the prairies? There's a nice pine forest down there where you were working. Yeah. Did you happen to get a chance to go up there and look at it? I did not see it in any of the Thurston prairies where I worked. I've seen yeah. it on uh, Kit's uh, 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 
peninsula once or okay. twice. Yeah. Yeah, but I believe the Tahuya area, if I remember correctly. Oh, yeah. Oh, the yeah, Tahuya area, they're common. Yeah, that's, that's where I'd have you look for them. Uh, you go up there, and uh, uh, you just go above Belfair. And you go up on the ridge. Anywhere on the ridge, there's a nice pine forest just above uh, Belfair. And this butterfly is in there. Uh, you'll, you'll find it. And once again, it's a spring butterfly. You find it in Bone Bay, and, and you'll see it. Uh, this is the female of it. Once again, you see how that theme is, how the, the female generally is a little lighter in color, a uh, little more orange, and that, that is really characteristic of a lot of our species. So, Is there one or the other pine species that it tends to be um, Well, in western Washington, now I'm just going from what I know. Um, what I've seen it on is watch book. And in eastern Washington, uh, Basically, it's always been ponderosa. Now, I don't know. Dave would be the expert on food plants. Maybe, maybe they feed on all kinds of pines. But I have only time I've seen it in Western Washington has been where there's been a lot of That doesn't mean that's exclusively it. Those have been my experience too. Like yeah. The whole West and yeah. California. Ah, see, this one's a slam dunk. This is our only butterfly, and it has. It looks like a checker spot. Uh, it's our only hair streak that has a checkered appearance to it. Take a look at this basal area. All the rest of them are all solid color, remember? They're all brown, usually. Light or dark, maybe some orange. But this one is all checkered. See? And it's got a nice hair streak line. And also, unbelievable, look at these chevrons. I have never seen anything like it. These chevrons are gigantic. They go all the way to the hair streak line. Look at them. Boom, great big. Chevrons, you just don't see that in any other history. So you look at that, and uh, you'll never, for, you'll never forget this butterfly. It's, it's just unique, and it's going to be around pine. So look for it in eastern Washington, Ponderosa pine belts. You'll see it there and in western Washington, anywhere where you find a large collection of, uh, of uh, lodgepole. Look for a lodgepole forest, which is rare because we haven't seen those this far in Hemlock. But if you find uh, and cedar. But if you find a logical area up there where you could find this butterfly. And uh, it has been found, like you said, Kitsap County, you've seen it. it it's been in records for there, Mason, Thurston. Uh, this is basically in the west side. And the east side is pretty common along the uh, eastern Cascades, wherever you have ponderosa belts. And our last one. Thank you for bearing with this. I know it's been a long evening. But uh, this is our gray hair steak, and that's all I have to say. Uh, this is our only gray hair streak. We have a blue one, lots of brown ones, but this is our only gray one. And this is <coughs> gray color, and it has this big, huge orange spot by the tail here, which will define this butterfly. Yeah, this is a very common butterfly. My daughter in Somerville, South Carolina, has this butterfly nectaring on her flowers in her yard. This butterfly, I believe, is throughout the United States. Isn't it, David? It's found almost everywhere. Yeah. And it feeds on almost anything. You ask a larva food plant, I think it would be easier to list what it doesn't eat rather than what it does eat. It doesn't eat rocks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the bottom surface is even gray. So it's gray on the top, gray on the bottom. But this is a butterfly that I think is pretty easy for you to recognize. And this is double brooded, so you're going to see this all year long. Uh, down in the Tuhui area, you'll see it in April and May. But I've seen this up at Sun Lakes in August. <coughs> in fact, Labor Day weekend I saw it. And so you'll find it uh, in flight just about any time during the spring and summer if you're in the right locality. But it has, like I said, it has food plants. Uh, it just eats, eats almost everything. Uh, hop farmers in eastern Washington have a little problem because it likes hops and uh, they're not too excited about it eating all their hops up or making uh, beer. So, but uh, anyway, uh, that's one of its food plants among many others. Okay, questions? Yeah? If an elephant is a hair streak, why are they elephants? Why don't we just call them hair streaks? Good question. No hair uh, I think because as a group, if you look at the elephants, they are a subgroup. I, I, I mean, you still call them hair strings, but the elephants kind of look different because of that in pocketing, which was best shown in the brown hair string or brown elephant. But they all have that, that kind of in pocket and the shape of their wings. 
I think is what sort of defines them as a subgroup. But, uh, you know, it's a good question. You know, people name these things. These butterflies didn't name themselves, you know. We do it. And we like to categorize things, and we like to do this and that and whatever. And for what reason? Sometimes we don't really have good reasons. You know, but, uh, so that's the best answer I can give you, is they do seem, the only one that doesn't fit with the others as well is the pine elephant. thing. It's really a unique butterfly on its own. As you can see, it's so bizarre. The ventral surface of that is just, just totally different. But the other, um, the other um, elephants look pretty much alike in the way they're built. Other questions? None? Now, did this help you? No. Yeah. If you bought in the field, are you going to be able to identify some of these? Okay. Yeah. And are you going to remember any of them? Yes. Because if you don't remember them, I've got a disc of them back there. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, because uh, all these pictures came from me, so that's good. You might just note that I think what you've got back there has all of the males yes. and females, yes. ventrals and I have males and females of all the species, and I also have the flight periods, I also have the food plants. So you can use it for a guide to go out in the field. Now, I think, David, you've already used it several times, haven't you, to find things? I've listed where I found them, uh, and some historic places as well, but I like to use, I want to make sure I know they're there first, before I tell people to go there. And so in, in that, you'll see the places I've listed are where I have personally seen them. And I know they're there. The problem with that is the time of year, the, the uh, weather patterns. I mean, I can tell you to go mid-April someplace to find this, and we might have had snow the week before. You know, and obviously there's nothing going to be out. So you have to kind of use a little bit of logic of what kind of a spring we've had or summer. Um, they don't always come out exactly as our flight periods say they have. That's why some of them have such a large range. You know, April to September. Give me a break. You know, well, they've done that because some years have been very cold. How many times have we seen our first sun after the 4th of July? You know, I mean, they may not even emerge until July when ordinarily if you had a nice June, they'd be out, see. So there's a lot of variabilities with this. So. But I've tried to help as best I could. I, I tried to list the things that, that I personally have found. I'm passing it on to you. You know, I've been working on this, this uh, database that I've had for 35 years. And so this is stuff that, you know, like David says, well, I want to get this and this and this and this and this. He emailed me and I said, David, you can't get all those in one trip. <laughs> I says, it took me maybe five years to get all of those. But I had, I had to go different times, different places to get them. It's not that easy. Butterflying in Washington, if you're trying to make a composite list of everything, it's not that easy. It takes a lot of time. You know. One of the things we've talked about, just for fun, would be to have a field trip that's a big Hare Street day. Yep. Um, you were just saying that's hard to do because we're all different times. Yep. But would you have a suggestion? Oh, absolutely. I, go I, and when I know exactly where to go. I'll tell you exactly where to go. Go along Oak Creek uh, the first week in August. Oh, this is or the, the last Yacomo, week in July. Yakima, Oak Creek. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go to Yakima, go to Natchez, go up Oak Creek, and uh, you go where the road bends and starts to go up. You don't want to be in the, you don't want to be in the hills. You want to be along the old, see, the, when I was doing all my work there, there was a road there. It's called the South Fork of Oak Creek. It had washed out, and they'd never replaced it. But you can walk it. So if you get where the road all of a sudden abruptly goes up, maybe you're there on time we went up to Oak Creek. Remember, and I told you that spot? Mm -hmm. Park, and then we went down on that, that old riverbed. Yep. Now, if you go along there, the last of July, first of August, mm -hmm. and look on Pearly Everlasting, you will be well rewarded. Mm -hmm. There'll be all kinds of hair streaks there. Mm -hmm. All kinds of hair streaks. That's probably the best composite place I would recommend. Another place, believe it or not, is the Reeser Creek area if you go late enough. You know, a lot of our field trips to Reeser Creek are early. They're like June. Well, you know, you go up there in July and you have a whole different array of species up there in July. It's totally different than it is in June. And you'll find a lot of hair streaks along there. Once again, pearly everlasting, dog bane. Look for those nectarine plants that they love. And you'll be rewarded. You'll find them up there too. So it's not that hard, really. So I would say those two places, Reeser Creek all the way up, but later, you want to go like July. You know, you don't, or 
Maybe Would the ancient time time when, when you might think everything's pretty burned out. Yeah, but it isn't. See where the the uh, pearly everlasting is. They, you know, pearly everlasting comes out late. You know, it'll be out. You'll see it in September. In you know, uh, but the wetter areas are better. In other words, if you go along where there's like a creek or there's a wet area, uh, you're more likely to see them because the flowers will be fresh. You don't want to get to an area that's totally dry, just you know, burn grass. But uh, you'll be amazed. Those meadows up at Reeser are really good late in the summer. You know, you'll get a lot of uh, fritillaries up there and everything. It's 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 pretty productive up there in, in late. You know, so you know there isn't just one time to go. Other questions? Well, I thank you all.